Hi, my name is Elsa Sunset. Uh, I'm a stroke neurologist in Oslo, and it's uh, great to welcome you here today to discuss the ELAN results uh, uh, with you. And I have it with me today uh, three people who have been heavily involved in the trial, the, the PIs, the co-PIs, Urs Fischer and Jesse Dawson, and the Japan lead, Masatoshi Koga. So uh, welcome, guys. Thank you. Hello. Well, we will start now with a presentation on uh, the main trial results. And of course, this uh, these results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, Urs, I think you will, will give us an overview of the main, main results. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure to present you the data which we also have presented at the European Stroke Organization Conference on, in May later this year. So here um, is the title of the ELAN trial. ELAN stands for Early versus Late Initiation of Direct Oral Anticoagulants in post Stroke Patients with Atrial Fibrillation. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, so it is important to notice that the ELAN trial is a purely academic trial funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation, the Swiss Heart Foundation, the British Stroke Association, and the National Cerebral and Cardiovascular Center um, in Japan. So for us clinicians, it is a huge dilemma when we can start anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation and an acute ischemic stroke. So whether the timing of direct oral anticoagulants initiation influences the risk of stroke recurrence and bleeding after an acute ischemic stroke is unclear. If we start early, we have the risk of an intracranial hemorrhage. If we start late, we have the risk of ischemic stroke recurrence. So the timing trial has shown that early initiation was not inferior to the late start of DOAC after acute ischemic stroke in, in people with atrial fibrillation. Nevertheless, we do not know whether an early start is even better compared to a late treatment start. So that was the aim of the ELAN trial. We aimed to estimate the effect of early initiation as compared with late initiation of anticoagulation and to estimate the degree of precision of these estimates. As already mentioned, ELAN was an investigator initiated international multicenter randomized control to arm assessor blinded trial. The first patient was randomized in October 2017. The last patient was followed up in December 2022. Overall, we aimed to randomize 2,000 patients. It is extremely important to notice that given the lack of unbiased data to formulate a rationale for a non-inferiority margin or an estimate for a potential superiority trial, no statistical hypotheses were tested. So we will not show any p-values in this presentation, but we will provide estimated ranges for outcome differences between the trial groups. So here you see the ELAN trial flowchart. Patients were classified according to the size of their stroke on imaging. If a patient had a minor or a moderate stroke, they, they were randomized within 48 hours, and if they were in the early treatment arm, treatment was started within 48 hours. If a patient with a minor stroke was in the late treatment arm, then treatment was initiated at day three or four. If the patient had a moderate stroke, treatment was started at day six or seven if the patient was in the late treatment arm. Patients with major strokes, they were only randomized at day six. And if they were in the early treatment arm, treatment was started at day six or seven. If they were in the late treatment arm, treatment was started at day 12, 13, or 14. The primary outcome was assessed at 30 days, secondary outcomes at 90 days. So here you see the primary and secondary outcomes. The primary outcome was a composite of recurrent ischemic stroke, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, major extracranial bleeding, systemic embolism, and or vascular death 
at 30 days, main secondary outcomes were the components of the primary outcome, death from any cause, non-major bleeding, modified ranking scale, and modified ranking scale shift at 30 and or 90 days. Here you now see the results of the ELAN trial. So overall, 2,032 participants were randomized in 100 sites in 15 countries in Europe, Middle East, and Asia. 2,013 patients fulfilled the analysis set and 1,006 uh, participants were allocated to the early treatment arm, 1,007 to the late treatment arm. At 30 days, only one patient was lost to follow up in the early treatment arm. At 90 days, two patients were lost to follow up, two in the early and two in the late treatment arm. Here you see the baseline characteristics, which were well balanced. So the median age was 77. Um, almost 45% uh, of the patients were female. And here you see the NIH stroke scale score on admission. It was five on admission and three at randomization. Almost 40% of the patients had a minor stroke, 40% uh, had a moderate stroke, and one fifth had a major stroke. It's important to notice that almost 40% of the patients had thrombolysis prior treatment start, and one fifth had a thrombectomy prior randomization. Now here you see the primary outcome at 30 days. A composite endpoint was uh, seen in 29 patients in the early treatment arm compared to 41 patients in the late treatment arm. If you look at the numbers of recurrent ischemic stroke, there were 14 patients in the early treatment arm and 25 in the late, uh, late treatment arm having an ischemic stroke at 30 days. Uh, there were four patients having systemic embolism at four de uh, 30 days and nine in the late treatment arm. Importantly, the number of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages were low and were equal in both treatment arms. Here you see similar results at 90 days. So 36 uh, patients had a composite outcome at 90 days compared to 54 patients in the late treatment arm. This corresponds to a, an adjusted odds ratio from 0.65, ranging from, from 0.42 to 0.99. Here again, you see that rates of the ischemic events were numerically lower in the early compared to the late treatment arm. And again, there were no differences in rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, a major extracranial bleeding or vascular death. Here you also see the adjusted risk differences at 30 days and at 90 days. And again, you see there was no hint that an early treatment is increasing the risk of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. However, you see that numerically events, ischemic events were lower in the early treatment arm. So what are the limitations of the ELAN trial? We were excluding people with therapeutic anticoagulation at baseline. We were excluding people with parenchymal hemorrhage type one or two. We were had a rather low NIH stroke scale score at randomization. However, please keep in mind that at least one fifth of participants had a severe stroke more than one third received thrombolysis, more than one fifth received thrombectomy, and there was no central adjudication of the stroke severity. What are now the implications? Based on the results of the ELAN trial, we can say that rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage are low with early anticoagulation if imaging-based classification is used. Early tr treatment initiation is reasonable, if indicated or if desired for logistic or other reasons. Early treatment is initiation is probably better and is unlikely to cause harm. And there is no reason to delay anticoagulation with DOACs in people with acute ischemic stroke and atrial fibrillation. 
I would like to thank to the participants and family steering committee, ELAN trial core group, to many other people, such as the DSMB clinical event committee, imaging core lab, and especially also to the participating sites who have randomized patients into the ELAN trial. As already mentioned, the results have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And with that, I would now like to hand over again to our moderator, Elsie Sanse. Uh, thank you very much, Urs, and uh, congratulations on completing a very important uh, trial and uh, also for completing uh, an academic trial, which really uh, requires tremendous effort, not just from you and your team, but for all participants uh, in the trial. My first question is going to be directed to, to, to Jesse, and uh, we're going to go straight into the key, key points. And that is, what do the, these results uh, mean to our patients? Yeah. so. I think that's obviously the, the the crucial question, isn't it? With, with any trial, once the results are there and we 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 interpret them as what do they actually mean on the ground? And and if I were a stroke patient, a stroke survivor with atrial fibrillation, there would really be two messages that I would take. I think overall, I would be reassured by the fact that the risk of early bleeding with a DOAC, if it's done properly with imaging guiding when we take our decisions is really rather low. And I think it's really important that we have those data because much of our assessment of risk is based on data from the heparin era, the warfarin era, where we now, I think, know quite clearly the risks were higher. So that would be message one. And, and number two would be that there is a very strong signal that there is a reduction in the risk of ischemic stroke in particular and of the, the composite outcome at 90 days. So I think for patients, it means that there is a absence of any suggestion of harm and there is a fairly strong signal that there is a reduction in the risk of early ischemic stroke. So I would view it as a, a marginal but important gain for patients without any significant risk or cost. I think this is an uh, important point, point here. And then uh, a question to you, Masatoshi, uh, and that is, uh, then on from the patient to the clinician, and uh, how, how do you think these results will influence our clinical practice? Mm. Because we had uh, many observational uh, researches, and based on the such uh, investigations, uh, always the uh, early uh, uh, drug initiation could be the safe, but uh, this trial is a randomized trial. Therefore, the we should we could be the more confident to use uh, drugs in early phase. So also, oh, this is the imaging based, and uh, we uh, classified into the three type of mild, moderate, and uh, severe stroke. So we could uh, make a uh, very clear clinical uh, uh, decisions on these patients, very uh, clear signal we could get, I believe. I think it's a really interesting um, set of data because I think all stroke physicians and neurologists who are watching this will agree that every time you start anticoagulation, you have uncertainty in your mind about, you know, there is some concern about the risk and benefits. It doesn't matter who the patient is. There's always a concern in the back of our mind about bleeding. And in the early period after stroke, we've always been uncomfortable with waiting, for example, 12 days in a severe stroke. And we've always been slightly worried about starting, for example, at one to three days in a TIA or a minor stroke. And I think what these data do for clinicians is remove a huge amount of that anxiety. So we can say, if I start a patient with a mild or moderate stroke at 36 hours, there is no evidence to support an increased risk of bleeding, and there's evidence to maybe suggest it's better. And that, to me, relieves a big source of anxiety from, from my practice in a fair number of patients. And if you have a patient with a severe stroke, you can say, I no longer need to worry between day five and day 12 when I think it's okay to start a DOAC, but guidelines tell me to wait. You no longer have to worry about leaving that patient at risk because you can go ahead and start without um, any concern about safety. So I, I, I think as a clinician, the data are quite anxiety reducing, which is, is quite nice, I think. 
I agree. I, we, some hesitation to use the drugs in early stage, but then now I'm confident to use in early stage. So. Same for me, and especially in those patients with with the the larger strokes or the the major strokes, where you have um, you know, the reason why they got their stroke is most likely due to their atrial fibrillation and a cardioembolic source with a large clot going off, and then uh, uh, you are not supposed to anticoagulate them, and it's 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 a uh, it's a scary time as uh, as a clinician, I think, in the, the, those days. So uh, for me as well, these are it gives me additional confidence to to think it, it's we it, it's okay to start uh, anticoagulation. Uh, uh, early. So then back to you, Urs. Uh, do you think the results will change our guidelines? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, I think we as PIs, we are not the people who are supposed to write the guidelines. You know, we now need independent academics who are reviewing our trial and also data from the timing trial, which has been published uh, last year. And as you probably also are aware of, there are other trials on the same topic ongoing, the START trial from the US and the big Optimus trial in the UK. And I think bringing together the evidence of all these trials, I assume that they will change the guidelines in the future. Nevertheless, this job has to be done by independent people who were not involved in designing these protocols. And an, another question, and this is for, for, for you, Urs, and also for, for, for Jesse. And uh, so the, the design of this trial is, is innovative and it is it challenges our way uh, on how we view data. And also uh, you, you need to turn a bit around in your head because there's no p-values. And uh, this is something we are not, not, not that used to thinking, looking at the results and we have no p-values. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about that, Urs? Uh, yes, so if you design a trial, you have to define a clinical hypothesis and you also have to try to formulate a statistical hypothesis. And you have different options. So you can say, I would like to do a so-called non-inferiority trial or I would like to do a superiority trial. And these trials have a lot of challenges. And if you want to formulate a statistical hypothesis, you need unbiased data on which you can formulate your statistical hypothesis. So back in 2014, when we designed the ELAN trial, there were no unbiased data. And a lot of physicians using DOACs at that time, they were quite reluctant to use DOACs in patients with major strokes. However, they were quite liberal in using these drugs in patients with TIA and minor strokes. So we had no unbiased data. And that was the reason why we felt that it is impossible to formulate a statistical hypothesis. We had a long discussion with our statisticians and that was the reason why we just said, okay, if we cannot define a statistical hypothesis, we will just make two groups. We will calculate the event rates in both uh, treatment arms, and then we will look at the confidence intervals in both treatment arms. And then at the end of the day, the clinician has to find an interpretation of these uh, of these data, and I think we ended up in a situation where, for at least for me as a clinician, the situation is rather clear. I don't see any risk in bleeding complications, especially symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. However, I see that numerically the rates of ischemic events are lower in the early treatment arms. So I don't see any reason not to start early. I know that some physicians are struggling with interpretation of our data, but as clinicians, we are doing that in everyday clinical practice. We are balancing risks and benefits, and we do not care about p-values in clinical practice. Another question for you is, uh, you have uh, led an academic trial through a pandemic, you reach your target sample size. And uh, I mean, that is a tremendous effort and big congratulations. Could you tell us a bit about how uh, how has your approach been to achieve this? 
and uh, also how uh, how have you worked in order to create this team atmosphere that you have done in the ELAN trial? And I'm of course a bit biased because I am the national lead in in Norway, so I I, I know the efforts that you have put in, but I would like to as you for you to tell us a bit about that. Well, uh, we were facing quite a lot of challenging years in the past, and uh, but I think there are several key features which were quite particular for the ELAN trial. First of all, it is an academic trial and the funding was very limited. So if you want to do big trials with limited funding, you need to have electronic means in order to do site initiations, monitoring and so on. So we already planned the trial prior to the pandemic uh, to be uh, an electronic trial. So we did a lot of remote monitoring by Zoom. We did all the site initiations uh, by Zoom. So we were not depending on traveling and going to different places. So I think that is the first uh, first point. Second, we designed the protocol that it is really simple and following clinical practice. So physicians also during the pandemic were treating stroke patients. So that means that they were um, with these patients, and the only thing what uh, was dif uh, was different from clinical routine wo was that the decision whether you start early or late was randomized. The primary uh, endpoint was assessed by phone interview at 30 days. So even during a, during a pandemic, you could uh, call the patients at home or wherever they were. So I think that was the, these were a lot of advantages we had to do such a trial. And last but not least, uh, we did such a trial in 15 countries. And as you are aware of, the pandemic was not peaking at the same time in all different 15 countries. So there were challenges in one country, we could continue in another country. The team atmosphere is really a challenge and uh, you have to motivate uh, your colleagues, your friends, you also have to um, uh, sometimes also to, to, to check what they are doing. And it's a very slim line in annoying people and encouraging them. So uh, it, is, it is quite delicate, but I think we managed quite well to get such a team spirit. And I think the most important thing is choose a burning question and have a lot of good friends. Good, good, good advice there, Jesse. Anything to add? No, I, I mean, I, I obviously agree, agree with those points, but I do think that the the choice of question can't be over, you know, overestimated. The certainly within the UK sites where I was more, you know, obviously di directly involved, it is a question that really resonated with the stroke physicians. It's a question they wanted the answer to, and you couple with that a pragmatic and simple trial that was easy to run and was well supported from the lead center, it, it, it worked very well. I think so too, and the study question really, having a randomization to aid when to start in the question where you don't really know when to start, uh, I think, uh, that made made a life easier uh, while, while uh, participating in, in in the trial because you could leave the decision when to start to the randomization uh, in this case and uh, while doing that uh, you we actually now have we're closer to an answer uh, on that note, uh, uh, and this is a question to all three of you, and we can start with uh, uh, Masatoshi. Uh, what are the next unanswered questions in the field of anticoagulation and stroke? I think uh, two, uh, two targets. Why the intracranial hemorrhage patient with AF? It's a very important question to answer. And the second is the uh, if related stroke on anticoagulation. So such patient could have the higher risk of the uh, recurrent ischemic stroke. So we may have the additional option uh, as a treatment as well. I fully agree what uh, Mashatoshi has said, especially the patients who are on full anticoagulation and despite taking the DOAX have another event. And uh, we are actually planning a trial exactly on that topic 
Um, and uh, we have just noticed two days ago the good news that this trial will be funded. Um, and uh, I think that is one of the burning questions. Another question is also, what should we do with patients with hemorrhagic transformation? And as you probably know, in the ELAN trial, patients with PH1 and PH2 hemorrhages were excluded. And I'm very happy to know that the Optimus trial, which is still running in the UK, is including these patients. And I hope that we will then also have an answer for these patients, because that's also a clinical dilemma um, and which should be answered. Yeah, and I think just the, the other area that I think is really quite interesting are the, the new classes of drugs. So the factor 11 antagonists may lead to similar clinical effects, but reduced bleeding. But again, that's obviously needs to be proven and needs to be studied in, in, in randomized trials. But it is, if you think of where we've advanced from warfarin, we've essentially found a group of drugs that are the same or slightly better that half the hemorrhage risk we now know that we can use them safely and earlier in, in people with, with stroke without any increased risk. And it may be in the coming years we have drugs that are equally effective and even safer still. So, uh, you know, I really do hope that, that, that the number of anticoagulant associated intracerebral hemorrhages we see will, will continue to fall um, over time, which would be a welcome advance for all of us. Absolutely. Uh, before we end, uh, anything more to add, Urs? Any final comments from you? No, I uh, I very much uh, enjoyed now after such long period to see that the results have been published, and I think what is I also very much appreciate that the journal accepted a non-classical approach, so that we were just estimating and not testing for superiority or non-inferiority. Because if we would have had uh, performed a non-inferiority trial with our event rates at 30 days, we would have had to randomize more than uh, 10,000 patients. And for an academic trial, this is simply impossible. And therefore, I'm extremely pleased that we could also convince the reviewers and the editors that sometimes you need novel approaches to answer clinically relevant questions. I think on that note, we can uh, end uh, this webinar. It's been a great uh, discussion uh, and it's also been fantastic to work with you uh, and the team on the ALAN trial. And uh, we look forward to future trials from uh, your end viewers and uh, future collaborations. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.